Afternoon, it's both actually, it's just 12 o'clock, so to all of you, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this particular session. I am Dr. Dipankar Saharia. I will moderate this session, which is very important from India's perspective. As you have seen uh, the topic, it's not there, sustainable food value chain, leveraging indigenous technologies for climate resilience. This is a topic that is in the intersection of technology, sustainability, and culture. Now, as the world is grappling with the issue of climate change, we are facing a strong challenge with regard to food security. And the challenge is how to have a food system that can be sustainable. Now, minimizing resource utilization, you know, decreasing the environmental de degradation, we have a way for sustainable food value chain. Climate change has added more impetus to this whole topic. And the very erratic rainfall, extreme weather events, and the rise in temperature has given a lot of challenges with regard to agricultural production. Our overall food chain and therefore, this is one of the most important topic that needs to be discussed, and we have to find a way out. As we already know about the importance of indigenous knowledge or local knowledge, and how it is so important for us to inculcate in our system today. Now, when you talk about having resilient climate resilient in our food system, in a food value chain, we also have to see the importance of indigenous knowledge that how technologies that are there with the indigenous community are useful to us. The indigenous knowledge, indigenous communities, they have lived in harmony with the environment. I am from Northeast India, so I have seen more of the indigenous people, the tribal people in the Northeast, and how they have coped up to the changing climate. They have an agriculture system that is tuned to the local environmental condition. And therefore, we need to learn from them how they have adapted to the changing climate. So as we take this forward, we also have seen that how different adaptation and resilient measures there the indigenous knowledge, indigenous community has been using. In terms of, if you see the seed varieties everywhere, every part of India, or if you see some very important water conservation efforts, you have different examples. In the hills there are, you know, terrace. In Nagaland you have a, a name called Zabo system, where they are having livestock and terrace farming at the same time, which helps in water conservation. Similarly, you have a very strong, you know, food preservation system with the indigenous communities. The solar drying system, long being used, now we have having modern systems. We are also having uh, the system of fermentation. So those are very low cost no energy uh, use, you know, preservation system. Not only this, we have Terry, I'm from Terry, uh, so we have done a lot of studies in the Northeast, especially in documenting indigenous knowledge, and we have found out that how important indigenous knowledge is there for the health care system also. And documenting, we have documented those, and they are being utilized. The only important thing that you know we have to give that back to the communities. 
when you go there in the field and you know talk to them they are not willing to share because earlier probably you know they have not got the benefit which they are due for and when we get some good thing it is always important that the commercial part that we benefit that we get from them are also shared with the community so that thing we really have to assure them that whatever is being done by us because finally the climate resilience that we are looking for in the food value system and integrating with indigenous knowledge we have to find the benefit and we also have to give benefit back to those and aligning them with the modern scientific system the r&d system that we really want to integrate both and the adaptability that they have they have long learned this process everywhere all the states wherever uh, are my distinguished panel panelists are from they would understand the importance of indigenous knowledge innovations and the balance that they have with you know with regard to biodiversity with regard to ecology so there is a balance and there they work everything in sus in sustaining their effort and to a sustainable goal so we have a lot of things to learn so with this initial remark i would like to welcome the very distinguished panelist and all the guests today that have joined us a warm welcome to all of you we would there are many subtopics that have been given to our distinguished panelist and each one would be requested to speak on the subtopic and i will put a question on that once we have the first round if that time permits we'll go for the second round of questions and then we'll have a q and a session for the entire audience then we'll sum up so this is how our session would go uh, with this word i thank you all for joining and i would now request one by one our panelists to speak on their topic and then the format that i have just spoken thank you so much amongst us uh, dr alok mukherjee who is the co-founder and director of products research and analytics at leeds next tech india limited and i would request uh, dr mukherjee to speak on the data driven solutions for enhancing food value chain efficiency leveraging space tech for better resource allocation it's all to you you can go there or what you have a mic in front of you also firstly uh, good afternoon respected delegates and all uh, this is alok mukherjee from let's next tech so and thank you uh, wfi for inviting me to share my thoughts on this so i would like to keep it very uh, brief uh, uh, sir has rightly pointed out the importance of sustainability in this context but uh, since i am coming from the research side and uh, few of the things we have we have uh, have done studies across india uh, for the yield modeling and Uh, regarding other things also from the crop grazing estimations and all so when we are saying uh, this theme is very pertinent why when we have already like uh, two years back the global population crossed 8 billion and silently land has been degrading and we have a very contrasting picture also that demand is also increasing and uh, interestingly productivity has also been increased in many areas now this is a moment uh, this this is something this is something which should be celebrated or definitely should be celebrated but kind of alarm also why because of sustainability so what is uh, when we are saying my my uh, topic was that constructing that food dynamics the food ecosystem dynamics uh, through data driven solutions and specifically on specific driven ai what i wish to share and uh, with all humility and everything that when we are talking about sustainability right now this is this is one word which is no more confined to any boardroom discussions any conference or any kind of academia or textbook thing now it's a reality and when we are saying sustainability so there is a textbook definition that yes balance between environment economy and society but in the context of value chain it is a network of stakeholders if i uh, from the technical side side if i say that like each stakeholder is a kind of a node and interrelationship between any two stakeholders is like kind of a edge so sustainability means 
this has to be ensured at the node level this has to be ensured at in different ages in this network but how is it possible or what are the things that now we need to take care if i have to put it in a very uh, simpler manner what i uh, uh, means understood in my journey journey through this all food ecosystem analytics and whatever studies we have done and we did some through rigorous uh, r and d on this if i have to segregate the entire chain to make it sustainable then first one should be food system dynamics and then market intelligence if i am talking about the entire food value chain and the soul of this food value chain is the food ecosystem dynamics now interestingly a very very important point uh, sir mentioned about the local practices now when we develop models uh, we have uh, worked for the nodal agencies of uh, government state central we are part of the one one of the most prestigious command center which was deployed for the uttar pradesh also but one thing i would like to say that we have seen and witnessed that this crop management practices is a challenge actually to inculcate or to include those data into the models why the data that we are getting from the fields the kind of cleaning and transformation is required but any kind of transformation can be an invitation to dilution also if it is beyond threshold so when we are saying and discussing about uh, uh, the sustainability in the food value chain my point would be that let's segregate in the, in the entire this food value chain into two broad modules the first one should be the food ecosystem the food system dynamics then market intelligence and the soul of the entire thing is the food system dynamics and then the most important thing where space tech ai driven solutions come into the picture because we uh, need to have a 360 degree view of the entire ecosystem when we are saying value chain ecosystem we need to understand that the crop clusters the productivity in the local areas if productivity is, is being increased in some region so this trend is going to stay with us or will deplete because of the wrong crop management practices maybe excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides maybe so we need to look into this one there are many uh, uh, scenarios we have witnessed that years back we had huge productivity in some region now there are alarms in those regions why because sometimes uh, excessive to make uh, uh, productive means uh, to make a land a uh, very product productive we need to understand that are we exploiting or making the land it relation very sustainable this is these are these are the few things that we can take care of uh, through uh, means we can have a very holistic view through space tech ai uh, solutions and all what we did and uh, i would like to wrap up because i i want to keep it very brief and I, i i would like to answer the questions if there are any so when we are saying space tech and uh, uh, this one so i am from the remote sensing background i would like to say with all humility that let's quantify and construe the process factors first the root regions and that should be the soul of any kind of models and all because what kind of productivity we are right now forecasting for this region this will happen or not in next after 5 years or maybe my model is working for here it may not work for other regions why right now india is dealing with 100 127 ecological zones it is not a joke 127 ecological around 130 ecological zones means each zone has a local coefficient local threshold parameters so we need to take care of those things also so any kind of success in one region don't as don't guarantee the success in other regions also any kind of uh, increase in productivity we need to ask that it's a positive trend or negative trend in the context of next few few years we have done one study in bareilly also the next uh, tomorrow we are going to launch our technical handbook also on the sigma for bareilly we did one a very interesting study two years back and then after that we went to some kind of uh, government projects we assess that okay productivity dynamics is okay uh, looks very positive but till 2047 we have forecasted the land escape dynamics there the soul is food system dynamics and the central part of the food system dynamics is the land system parameters so till 2047 we did some kind of forecast and all and we thought 
and we came up with some kind of uh, observations that in next few years we may have some kind of alarming pictures in do those regions and we have identified those hotspots also. After two years, recently we joined uh, one government project also and then in one of the technical co committee, the exact point was raised that now this is happening near, here in Western UP. So I would like to uh, wrap up with uh, this statement that sustainability is all about maintaining the balance, but we need to take care of and we need to, uh, uh, need to have a uh, really robust hyperlocal intelligence at the node level. Let's uh, make sure that at node level we are okay, then only we can take care of the other parts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, uh, we do agree that you know local specific treatments would, are required uh, at each of the ecological zones that we have in India, and for that, the space tech and the data that is so important locally, so that we exactly have the right uh, methods of sustainability used in all parts of you know different ecoclimatic zones that we have in India. Uh, now, based on that, uh, I would like to put one question to you, uh, that how can satellite-based weather forecasting and climate monitoring help mitigate risks associated with extreme events in agriculture, as we all are facing all over India now, more often now? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you so much for this question, sir. Yes, it's a very uh, pertinent question. Uh, definitely weather forecast is uh, the weather analytics, the entire spectrum of weather analytics is a uh, central part of this journey, one of the most important part, if, if, if not central, but definitely very, very important. But yes, uh, so I'd like to share uh, some of the things in the context of this one. If I have to put it broadly, a kind of a textbook uh, 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 reply that uh, for the crop management and planning, for the uh, paste and disease monitoring, for the advisory and alerts, these things are okay. For the scheduling irrigation and all, these forecasts are, the weather-based advisories are very much important. Broadly for the risk uh, mitigation, uh, risk management and mitigation thing. Two things I would like to point out here. When we are talking about sustainability, it means the entire spectrum needs to be taken care of. Right now, and I would like to put uh, this fact uh, on the floor because Weather forecast analytics, uh, weather analytics is very much required for the risk management and all. Two things I would like to share, uh, because this should be right now in the uh, discussion, uh, it should be the uh, part of the main uh, mainstream discussion now. What about data-driven insurance, which is very much important uh, to care of the, uh, the social sustainability of the farmers and the entire stakeholders. So when I'm saying data-driven in insurance, now, uh, two, three months back or uh, around five, maybe five months back, I attended some uh, FinTech uh, summit also. So right now there has been a huge discussion regarding this one, but it's still mostly in India. It's conventional insurance which is in the uh, play. But data-driven insurance is going to play a huge role. And as you mentioned, sir, in the beginning also, that uh, climate resilient practices. I'm not just talking about that if we are having a scenario where heat is crossing the threshold, and then some heat re uh, uh, resilient uh, uh, variety, we can, we, we can be uh, 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 means opting for that one, like uh, in roughly I'm saying, suppose you, we opt for the millets and all. But I'd like to say one more thing. It's very much now necessary to have a long-term clim climate trend analysis to understand that if there is any shift required in the farming practices also, maybe there are many crop clusters in this country which is now getting saturated, maybe there is a now need to of shift from crop A to B. So two things are very much important. And again, I would like to, uh, this one, because uh, when we work on the yield models and all, and we have, uh, as I mentioned, that we have already submitted all those things. So all these crop management plan, the disease-based monitoring, the irrigation scheduling, all are part of this one. But for the sustainability aspect beyond these things, these things should also be the pic picture. And now data-driven insurance right now, uh, roughly, means generally we, we say the parametric insurance and all, but there are uh, huge uh, 
I mean, things which are in the positive direction when you talk about the parametric insurance. There are challenges which we now uh, need to address and it's about the threshold. And again, threshold is dependent on the ecological zones. So everything is interrelated. That's why I said in the very beginning that let's take care of the node first, then age, and then the value chain will be sustainable. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, I will come to you again uh, if time permits. Uh, now I'd request uh, Mr. Shantanu Sharma, uh, who is the co-founder and chief marketing officer of Pro Zero Carbon, uh, in, in, based in India. And uh, he, uh, Mr. Sharma would speak on indigenous innovations and climate crisis resilience. So may I request uh, Mr. Sharma to, yeah, to have the initial remarks. Thank you. Uh, first, we came out safe from COVID. We came out safe from a couple of days back from the asteroid also. So, kuch to meaning hoga amari life ka, which is why we are all alive. So, that is one thing which we need to take uh, real cognizance of. Second, major imposter syndrome because a lot of people sitting here are uh, much, much more uh, experienced in this field than me. So what we basically do um, at Pro Zero Carbon is we look at data. And when we talk about climate resilience, I feel the most important element that we miss out and which Dr. Mukherjee also spoke about is data. In terms of what works for one zone or one area may or may not be relevant to another area. Just because one crop practice has worked in, let's say, Rajasthan, it may not work in Tamil Nadu. If it has worked in Karnataka, it may not work in Sikkim. What we try to analyze is what are the practices in different areas of India, of the world, and what is the data related to it. Ultimately, all data is Bijli Pani waste. How much electricity you consumed for your practices, how much water were you able to save during these practices, and ultimately, how much waste material you were able to generate, which you either burnt as stubble or were able to utilize later or were able to monetize by making it into pellets and giving to a manufacturing company probably. All this data becomes relevance for two things. One is how can we increase the yield of a crop? How can we have better practices as the yield grows up? And second, and an element which we tend to miss in terms of sustainability a lot of times is how much emission or how much damage we are doing to the environment from the practices. So when we say Western practices are very advanced and it is all automated and this, I sometimes disagree because I think indigenous practices have been there, which is the largest agrarian society in the world. We are sitting in that same country. India is amongst the largest agrarian societies of the world, which means we have done something right over the years. And I think what we have to understand is a lot of practices were meaningful hundreds of years ago and are still meaningful. The only thing lacking is data to prove that this is better than anything else. And that's where we try to come in and figure out everything related from how much have you as an input put into this practice and depending on the output, what have you been able to bring out? And if we are able to link it to data in terms of weather patterns, in terms of how you are able to impact the society or how you are able to work with the local population, all of that becomes very strong to help every farmer, every company and even consumers decide what is the best practice as far as sustainability goes. Uh, because I can't stress this enough that I agree with the Dr. Alok Mukherjee when he said that this is sustainability has gone beyond boardroom talk. Um, if we still don't realize the importance of it, then um, all the best to all of us. We'll wait for the next asteroid. But uh, if we want to do something about it, and if we feel that we need to do this for economical reasons, for social reasons, or just for staying alive, the real essence of it is collecting enough data and proving that this practice is better than any other for this geography, for this year. It may or may not be relevant even year wise and that's what we've seen in some of our researches uh, when we worked with some farmers based in Tamil Nadu that year on year 
and uh, some of you would know that the water table has reduced in Tamil Nadu. So the water requirements have changed, which means the plants that can be grown in that region have also, be, have also undergone a transition. To understand that, not from an anecdotal point of view, but from a data point of view, becomes important. Uh, that's what we try to help companies and organizations and farmers with, and we hope to continue doing this and give you enough data to make the right choice. Um, and I hope you will remember, if not anything else, from this three, four minutes, the relevance of data in doing any kind of practice that you take care of. Um, I'll wrap up with that, sir, and I'll open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll sit here or take the question there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, definitely, I agree. You know, our planning, our strength amongst us, uh, Dr. Alok Mukherjee who is the co-founder and director of products, research, and analytics at Leeds Next Tech India Limited. And I would request uh, Dr. Mukherjee to speak on the data-driven solutions for enhancing food value chain efficiency, leveraging space tech for better resource allocation. It's all to you. You can go there or you have a mic in front of you also. Uh, firstly, uh, good afternoon, respected delegates and all. Uh, this is Alok Mukaji from Let's Next Tech. So, and thank you, uh, WFI, for inviting me to share my thoughts on this. So I would like to keep it very uh, brief. Uh, uh, sir has rightly pointed out the importance of sustainability in this context. But uh, since I'm coming from the research side and a uh, few of the things we have, we have uh, <coughs> done studies across India uh, for the yield modeling and uh, regarding other things also, you know, crop agrarian estimations and all. So when we are saying uh, this theme is very pertinent, why? When we have already, like uh, two years back, the global population crossed 8 billion, and silently land has been degrading, and we have a very contrasting picture also, that demand is also increasing, and uh, interestingly, productivity has also been increased in many areas. Now this is a moment. Uh, this this is a something. This is something which should be celebrated, or definitely should be celebrated. But kind of alarm also. Why? Because of sustainability. So what is uh, when we are saying my my uh, topic was that considering that food dynamics, the food ecosystem dynamics uh, through data driven solutions, and specifically on specific driven AI. What I wish to share and uh, with all humility and everything that when we are talking about sustainability, right now this is, this is one word which is no more confined to any boardroom discussions, any conference, or any kind of academia or textbook thing. Now it's a reality. And when we are saying sustainability, so there is a textbook definition that yes, balance between environment, economy, and society. But in the context of value chain, it is a network of stakeholders. If I, uh, from the technical side, if I say that like, each stakeholder is a kind of a node. And interrelationship between any two stakeholders is a kind of an edge. So sustainability means this has to be ensured at the node level. This has to be ensured at in different edges in this network. But how is it possible? Or what are the things that now we need to take care? If I have to put it in a very uh, simpler manner, what I... Uh, uh, means understood in my journey, journey through this all food ecosystem analytics and whatever studies we have done. And we did some through rigorous uh, R&D on this. If I have to segregate the entire chain to make it sustainable, then first one should be food system dynamics and then market intelligence. If I'm talking about the entire food value chain. And the soul of this food value chain is the food ecosystem dynamics. Now, interestingly, a very, very important point uh, Sir mentioned about the local practices. Now, when we develop models, uh, we have uh, worked for the nodal agencies of uh, government, state, central. We are part of the one, one of the most prestigious command center which was deployed for the Uttar Pradesh also. But one thing I would like to say that we have seen and witnessed that this crop management practices is a challenge actually to inculcate or to include those data into the models. Why? the data that we are getting from the fields, the kind of cleaning and transformation is required, but any kind of transformation can be an invitation to dilution also if it is beyond threshold. So when we are saying and discussing about uh, uh, the sustainability in the food value chain, 
my point would be that let's segregate in the, in the entire this food value chain into two broad modules. The first one should be the food ecosystem, the food system dynamics, then market intelligence, and the soul of the entire thing is the food system dynamics, and then the most important thing, where specific AI-driven solutions come into the picture. Because we uh, need to have a 360 degree view of the entire ecosystem, when we're saying value chain ecosystem. We need to understand that the crop clusters, the productivity in the local areas, if productivity is, is being increased in some region, so this trend is going to stay with us or will deplete because of the wrong crop management practices, maybe excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides, maybe. So we need to look into this one. There are many uh, uh, scenarios we have witnessed that years back we had huge productivity in some region. Now there are alarms in those regions. Why? Because sometimes uh, excessive to make uh, uh, productivity means uh, to make a land uh, very produ productive. We need to understand that are we exploiting or making the land utilization very sustainable. This is these are these are the few things that we can take care of uh, through. Uh, uh, means we can have a very holistic view through space tech AI uh, solutions and all. What we did, and uh, I would like to wrap up because I, I want to keep it very brief, and I, 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 would, I would like to answer the questions if there are any. So when we are saying space tech and uh, uh, this one, so I am from the remote sensing background. I would like to say with all humility that let's quantify and construe the process factors first the root regions, and that should be the soul of any kind of models and all. Because what kind of productivity we are right now forecasting for this region, this will happen or not in next after five years, or maybe my model is working for here, it may not work for other regions, why? Right now, India is dealing with 127 ecological zones. It is not a joke. 127 ecological, around 130 ecological zones means each zone has a local coefficient local threshold parameters. So we need to take care of those things also. So any kind of success in one region don't, as, don't guarantee the success in other regions also. Any kind of uh, increase in productivity, we need to ask that it's a positive trend or negative trend in the context of next few, few years. We have done one study in Bareilly also. The next, uh, tomorrow we are going to launch our technical handbook also on the Sigma. For Bareilly, we did one a very interesting study two years back. And then after that, we went to some kind of uh, government projects. We assessed that, okay, productivity dynamics is okay. Uh, looks very positive. But till 2047, we have forecasted the landscape dynamics there. The sole is food system dynamics. And the central part of the food system dynamics is the land system parameters. So till 2047, we did some kind of forecast and all. And we thought and we came up with some kind of uh, observations that in next few years, we may have some kind of alarming pictures in do those regions, and we have identified those hotspots also. After two years, recently we joined uh, one government project also, and then in one of the technical co committee, the exit point was raised that now this is happening near, here in Western UP. So I would like to uh, wrap up with uh, this statement that Sustainability is all about maintaining the balance, but we need to take care of, and we need to, uh, uh, need to have a uh, really robust hyperlocal intelligence at the node level. Let's uh, make sure that at node level we are okay, then only we can take care of the other parts. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, uh, we do agree that you know local specific treatments would are required uh, at each of the ecological zones that we have in India, and for that, the space tech and the data that is so important locally, so that we exactly have the right uh, methods of sustainability used in all parts of you know different ecoclimatic zones that we have in India. Uh, now, based on that, uh, I would like to put one question to you uh, that. How can satellite-based weather forecasting and climate monitoring help mitigate risks associated with extreme events in agriculture, as we all are facing all over India? 
now, more often now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you so much for this question, sir. Yes, it's a very uh, pertinent question. Uh, definitely weather forecast is uh, the weather analytics, the entire spectrum of weather analytics is a uh, central part of this journey. One of the most important part, if, if, if not central, but definitely very, very important. But yes, uh, so I'd like to share uh, some of the things in the context of this one. If I have to put it broadly, a kind of a textbook uh, of, uh, reply that uh, for the crop management and planning, for the uh, pest and disease monitoring, for the advisory and alerts, these things are okay. For the scheduling irrigation and all, these forecasts are, the weather-based advisories are very much important. Broadly for the risk uh, mitigation, uh, risk management and mitigation thing. Two things I would like to point out here. When we are talking about sustainability, it means the entire spectrum needs to be taken care of. Right now, and I would like to put uh, this fact uh, on the floor, because weather forecast analytics, uh, weather analytics is very much required for the risk management and all. Two things I would like to share, uh, because this should be right now in the uh, discussion, uh, it should be the uh, part of the main uh, mainstream discussion now. What about data-driven insurance, which is very much important uh, to care of the, uh, the social sustainability of the farmers and the entire stakeholders? So when I'm saying data-driven in insurance, now uh, two, three months back or uh, around five, maybe five months back, I attended some uh, FinTech uh, summit also. So right now there has been a huge discussion regarding this one, but it's still mostly in India. It's conventional insurance which is in the uh, play. But data-driven insurance is going to play a huge role. And as you mentioned, sir, in the beginning also, that climate resilient practices. I'm not just talking about that if we are having a scenario where heat is crossing the threshold and then some heat re uh, uh, resilient uh, uh, variety we can we, we can be uh, 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 opting for that one like in roughly i'm saying suppose you, we opt for the millets and all but i'd like to say one more thing it's very much now necessary to have a long term clim climate trend analysis to understand that if there is any shift required in the farming practices also. Maybe there are many crop clusters in this country which is now getting saturated. Maybe there is a now need to of shift from crop A to B. So two things are very much important. And again, I would like to, uh, this one, because uh, when we work on the yield models and all, and we have, uh, as I mentioned, that we have already submitted all those things. So all these crop management plan, the disease based monitoring, the irrigation scheduling, all are part of this one. But for the sustainability aspect beyond these things, these things should also be the pic picture. And now data-driven insurance right now, uh, roughly, means generally we, can, we say the parametric insurance and all, but there are uh, huge uh, things which are in the positive direction when you talk about the parametric insurance. There are challenges which we now uh, need to address and it's about the threshold. And again, threshold is dependent on the ecological zones. So everything is interrelated. That's why I said in the very beginning that let's take care of the node first, then age, and then the value chain will be sustainable. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, I will come to you again uh, if time permits. Uh, now I'd request uh, Mr. Shantanu Sharma, uh, who is the co-founder and chief marketing officer of Pro Zero Carbon uh, in, in, based in India. And uh, he, uh, Mr. Sharma would speak on indigenous innovations and climate crisis resilience. So may I request uh, Mr. Sharma to, yeah, to have the initial remarks. Thank you. Uh, first, we came out safe from COVID. We came out safe from a couple of days back from the asteroid also. So, kuch to meaning hoga amari life ka, which is why we are all alive. So, that is one thing which we need to take uh, real cognizance of. Second, major imposter syndrome because a lot of people sitting here are 
much, much more uh, experience in this field than me. So what we basically do um, at Pro Zero Carbon is we look at data. And when we talk about climate resilience, I feel the most important element that we miss out and which Dr. Mukherjee also spoke about is data. In terms of what works for one zone or one area may or may not be relevant to another area. Just because one crop practice has worked in, let's say, Rajasthan, it may not work in Tamil Nadu. If it has worked in Karnataka, it may not work in Sikkim. What we try to analyze is what are the practices in different areas of India, of the world, and what is the data related to it. Ultimately, all data is Bijli Pani waste. How much electricity you consumed for your practices, how much water were you able to save during these practices, and ultimately, how much waste material you were able to generate, which you either burnt as stubble or were able to utilize later or were able to monetize by making it into pellets and giving to a manufacturing company, probably. All this data becomes relevant for two things. One is, how can we increase the yield of a crop? How can we have better practices as the yield grows up? And second, and an element which we tend to miss in terms of sustainability a lot of times is how much emission or how much damage we are doing to the environment from the practices. So when we say Western practices are very advanced and it is all automated and this, I sometimes disagree because I think indigenous practices have been there, which is the largest agrarian society in the world. We are sitting in that same country. India is amongst the largest agrarian societies of the world, which means we have done something right over the years. And I think what we have to understand is a lot of practices were meaningful hundreds of years ago and are still meaningful. The only thing lacking is data to prove that this is better than anything else. And that's where we try to come in and figure out everything related from how much have you as an input put into this practice and depending on the output, what have you been able to bring out? And if we are able to link it to data in terms of weather patterns, in terms of how you are able to impact the society or how you are able to work with the local population, all of that becomes very strong to help every farmer, every company and even consumers decide what is the best practice as far as sustainability goes. Um, because I can't stress this enough that I agree with the Dr. Alok Mukherjee when he said that this is sustainability has gone beyond boardroom talk. Um, if we still don't realize the importance of it, then um, all the best to all of us. We'll wait for the next asteroid. But uh, if we want to do something about it, and if we feel that we need to do this for economical reasons, for social reasons, or just for staying alive, the real essence of it is collecting enough data and proving that this practice is better than any other for this geography, for this year. It may or may not be relevant even year wise and that's what we've seen in some of our researches uh, when we worked with some farmers based in Tamil Nadu that year on year and uh, some of you would know that the water table has reduced in Tamil Nadu. So the water requirements have changed which means the plants that can be grown in that region have also, be, have also undergone a transition. To understand that not from an anecdotal point of view but from a data point of view becomes important. Uh, that's what we try to help companies and organizations and farmers with and we hope to continue doing this and give you enough data to make the right choice. Um, and I hope you will remember, if not anything else, from this 3-4 minutes, the relevance of data in doing any kind of practice that you take care of. Um, I'll wrap up with that, sir, and I'll open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll sit here and take the question there. Okay, thank you. Uh, definitely, I agree. You know, our planning, our strategies, can they take to mitigate the climate risk and achieve sustainability? Um, I'm going to link it to what I said earlier in terms of uh, understanding indigenous practices and a lot of uh, even smaller food manufacturing companies are dependent on farmers where they have to rely on local support and understanding that in perspective of what will work in one area of the country compared to anything else makes a lot of difference. Um, we have defined metrics, uh, and I'm sure all, a lot of us know the metrics that, and I said that briefly, what are the key things to monitor as far as your, sustain, as far as your sustainability goes? Even for a small manufacturer, a small supplier matters a big deal, where a larger 
organization will need to work with smaller manufacturers also. So it is not just a discussion for um, a larger big company, it is even for smaller manufacturers and smaller companies who also have to adopt this. But sometimes there are gaps because of maybe lack of capital, maybe lack of understanding, maybe the lack of just sheer knowledge of this is something that's possible. So if we are able to, like I said, bring the right data sets to them and tell them that this can help you acquire more clients as larger companies do better and earn more, then that would make sense to even smaller suppliers. So in terms of metrics, I think we have to monitor everything from start to finish in the supply chain and try to um, adapt data in some manner to share with the smaller company and the larger company as well. So thank you, uh, Mr. Sharma. I'll again come back to you. Uh, now I'd request uh, Ms. Opira Bhatia. Uh, she is the Senior Director of Corporate and Government Affairs for India, uh, CGA Lead for Asia uh, from Mondelez. Uh, I request uh, uh, Ms. Bhatia to speak on enhancing farm to folk sustainability, and then I'll put the question. Yeah, you can speak yeah. anywhere you are comfortable for. Since everybody started the okay. routine of okay. going there. <laughs> so it's more comfortable, <laughs> then you can go there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm from industry, right? And uh, therefore, I'm going to give a more industry perspective on agriculture. Uh, I'm from Mondelez. I don't know how many of you have heard about Mondelez. But uh, we make some of the products that you consume every day. Cadbury Dairy Milk, Oreo, Tang, Bon Vita. And as one of the largest chocolate manufacturing companies in the world, we depend on cocoa, right? We source a lo lo uh, lots of cocoa from India, and we import a lot of cocoa as well. So when you talk about farm to fork sustainability, for us, it's really a bean to bar journey. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how we have tried to incorporate sustainable agricultural practices in that entire process. So what is really this whole farm to fork approach? I think let's, let's set the context straight on that whole piece. It is really sustainable food production, whether it is the agri practices you use, whether it is the technology that you use. You have to reduce the impact of farming on the land, on the soil, on the water con uh, conservation. Improving efficiency of the resources that you use in, in farming. And of course, focusing on biodiversity as you move forward. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we are doing that in cocoa. The second part of it is really the whole distribution and processing part, where you actually try to reduce carbon footprint using energy efficient technologies, whether it is logistics, et cetera. The third part is really the consumption, which is what all, all of us do. So how do we have a lower impact food footprint as we consume? And the fourth part is the food waste reduction or loss. And where this becomes really important is not only in the processing part, but it's also in the storage, the shelf life, all of that, enhancing shelf life, etc. In India and globally, actually, Mondelez has a program called Coco Life. And uh, we were the first ones to bring the cocoa plant from Africa to India in 1955. And we actually planted it in the south of the country. Uh, the cocoa plant requires a tropical climate, and therefore today we work with over 100,000 farmers in growing cocoa. It's been a long journey. We've partnered with a lot of R&D institutes, a uh, lot of sustainable agricultural practices, some of which we have got from uh, our global partners, some of which are indigenously developed with the Kerala Agricultural University. Uh, we have nurseries that grow about 3 million saplings, where, which we actually put out uh, and distribute to the farmers. So there's a lot that happens, uh, and our basic focus is on sustainability and increasing biodiversity. So that's how we do. We work with the farmers. Our team actually helps them in extension services, using the right kind of technology, uh, water irrigation. How do you use the right kind of water? And about 20 years ago, we started a process called intercropping. So you use the same piece of land and grow both coconut, arecanut, as well as cocoa. 
So the farmer gets a dual income as, as well in all of that. All of this is a sustainable business practice. So I wanted to provide more a business perspective to the farm to fork or what we call the bean to bar journey. And that's coming from, uh, from us at Mondelez. Thank you. You'd like to take the question there? or you Ah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, interesting to know about, you know, uh, about the company, uh, the work that is being done, and especially uh, regard to, you know, sustainable food production, improving the efficiency and the biodiversity part, and the storage and the post-harvest management and the low carbon, you know, footprint that uh, the company has been uh, executing. Especially 1955 is the date when the cocoa plants. Is it first that it came? Yes, 1955? It was, it's okay. not an indigenous crop to India. So. Okay, <laughs> so it was first exotic, exotic species being yeah. grown in India. Uh, so I just want to uh, put a, you a question on this, that uh, how can industry stakeholders and farmers collaborate effect, effective, effectively to ensure that sustainability initiatives are economically viable? and beneficial across the entire food value chain? I think the one word is collaboration and partnerships. I think that's very, very crucial. We couldn't have done what we have done without the partnership of not only the farmers, but also the farming institutes, the agricultural institutes, and most importantly, with the government. The government has been a very, very big help in this entire journey. Um, you know, whether it is providing subsidies and incentives to the farmers to actually sort of grow cocoa, whether it is uh, working with uh, us as well as the agricultural universities on the technical assistance and training that we have to give, both for going the, growing the intercrop as well as for growing cocoa. Um, R&D has been a very, very important uh, role, and we have one of our cocoa uh, members uh, sitting at the back. Rajesh, put your hand up. Uh, and he is there uh, working with the government, with the R&D institutes. Um, also, the whole piece around supply chain integration and transparency, making sure that the journey is fully transparent right from the time that we grow the cocoa right to the time it goes to our factories. And of course, most important is working with the government to ensure that there are greater benefits. We want Coco, we want India to be Atmanirbhar in Coco. Currently, we import a lot of cocoa into this country. And there's a lot of scope to do that. So working with the government in that. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, I'd come to you again uh, with the second round of questions. Uh, uh, now, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mandeep Singh Tuli who is the Procurement Director of Nutrition and Ice Cream South Asia. I think that is the, your, you know, yeah, thank you. Uh, I would request uh, Mr. Tuli to speak on building resilient food value chain, the role of procurement strategies, strategies in adapting to climate change. Thanks a lot, Dr. Dipankar. Uh, very, very happy to be here and uh, part of this esteemed panel. And I think uh, it's really nice to hear the views of all the panelists, uh, especially in the area of uh, responsible sourcing, sustainable strategies, as well as uh, food processing. So thanks a lot for your views. And thank you, uh, Dr. Dipankar, for uh, having me here. Uh, so just an introduction from me. I'm Mandeep Singh Tuli, and I head the procurement for South Asia, for the nutrition and ice cream business of South Asia. And uh, today I'm also joined by my team members here. So we have uh, Daliram, Dipesh, and Ravi, who work with me as part of my team. So you can just put your hand up. So thanks a lot for joining me here. Uh, so essentially, uh, two areas I will uh, like to focus on uh, today in my talks. The first one will be around the area of uh, responsible sourcing, sustainable sourcing. And the second one will be in the area of uh, the extreme weather-related uh, disturbances and how do you basically uh, make your procurement strategy in the wake of all these events which uh, basically are happening uh, as we speak. So the first is on the, on the responsible sourcing. I think uh, what we need to understand is that it all starts with the end consumer. And uh, just to brief you that uh, before this, uh, I was actually uh, uh, working, in, uh, working in Europe where there is a very, very heightened awareness uh, by the consumer on where the materials are getting sourced from 
and they are sort of very clearly asking that what you are putting in my product, where are you sourcing it from and are you sourcing it responsibly? Okay. And then when I came to India two years back, I was so pleasantly uh, sort of surprised to see that there is also a very uh, emerging and growing awareness amongst the Indian consumers as well on the same. So that's something which is happening here. And I think the consumer companies like HUL and uh, all the others uh, will basically need to realize that they need to do a lot more of making sure that establishing the traceability of the materials and what we are putting in our end product, we should actually know that where is the sourcing happening from. So that's, the, I think, the first element which is there. And then comes the element of the responsible sourcing, that how you're sourcing and from where you're sourcing and whether you're sourcing responsibility. So what we want to sort of point out today is that for Unilever, we have four pillars uh, which we talk about in the area of uh, responsible sourcing. So we have uh, the climate, we have nature, we have plastics, we have livelihoods, and I'll just very briefly spend time uh, on this. So on the uh, area of uh, climate, uh, as in the other companies, we have taken a very aggressive stand. We want to be net zero by 2039, and we are looking at scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and we have aggressive reduction targets on uh, each of these. Uh, scope 1, Scope 2, of course, we have achieved a lot already, but we are now working with our extended supply chain on Scope 3 emissions, and we hope to uh, make a significant stride in the next uh, five years or so. So that's on the, uh, the climate. On the nature, again, I think we are very advanced in terms of all the key uh, crops which we are sourcing. Uh, we were already last year uh, sourcing from all the areas which are free from deforestation, and that's something which is also very important for the consumers because they're asking that, whether while making the products which we are consuming, are you sort of destroying any forest? So what we have done is that we are sourcing all the materials from deforestation-free uh, areas. And then we have started this very interesting uh, regenerative agriculture concept, and my colleague from uh, Mondelez was also referring to that. So here we work with uh, a lot of smallholder farmers, and we work on uh, how do we improve the health of the soil, how do we improve uh, water conservation, how do we improve the yield? So we are working on our key crops like tea, coffee, dairy, and tomatoes to see that how we can implement the regenerative agriculture practices. On plastics, is very simple. It's less of plastic, and it's use of better plastic, so more of recycling, so that's on the plastic. And then on the livelihoods, we basically have uh, uh, work with smallholders. We uh, buy almost close to around 160,000 tons of tea, so we are buying a uh, big quantity of tea from Assam uh, and West Bengal, and there we're working with the almost close to around 150,000 smallholders uh, to make sure that we uh, sort of improve the yields, improve the livelihoods of those smallholders. That's something which we are uh, very, very uh, aggressively working on. So this is the area of the responsible sourcing which I wanted to touch about. And I think the second one which I wanted to talk, talk about is the, uh, the fact that there are very extreme events happening on the, on the weather front. And uh, if I talk about some live examples so that I think you can relate to it. Uh, so in this year, we'll uh, actually end up losing more than around 120 million kilos of crop in tea between Assam and, uh, and West Bengal. And that's because of uh, extreme uh, weather conditions, dry conditions, um, sometimes excessive rainfall and all of that. And then on the tomatoes, we have developed a new unit in Bihar, but last season we found that the, it was completely, the season was destroyed, and then because of adverse weather conditions, we were not able to source any tomatoes. So it's not that something which we are going to get five years, ten years down the line. These events are impacting the sourcing, impacting the procurement as we speak now. That's the, something which I wanted to sort of uh, talk to you about. And how do we make the procurement strategies? The procurement strategies, you need to make sure that one is that you're working with the reliable suppliers and you also work in collaboration with the suppliers. You try to work with them to uh, help them to improve their yields, to help the smallholder lives, as I mentioned earlier. So that's one thing which uh, we uh, work on very intensively uh, with reliable suppliers. And the second is to have a geographical diversification. Like, for example, I source tea from not just from Assam. I do it from Assam, West Bengal. Uh, south of India, so I need to diversify my supplier base. Okay, so that's something which uh, uh, we need to do. And then I think uh, also try to work on uh, practices to improve the yields like uh, regenerative agriculture so that uh, at least few years hence when the practices are fully implemented, we don't face a shortfall in the crop. So those are the things which we work on. 
and then on the technology also we work quite uh, aggressively in terms of the technology like uh, just an example so we have uh, our tomato ketchup uh, kisan tomato ketchup so you'll find a qr code and when you scan that qr code it will take you back to the place where the tomatoes are getting sourced from and some farmers will be talking about their stories as to how they've been able to improve the yields and improve their income so those are the things which we're implementing and then in case of tea we are doing a T plus app where the farmers have access to the app. So we have almost 5,000 farmers who are already using this app. They are getting access to live information on the weather conditions, on the soil conditions, on what pesticides to use. So these are some initiatives which we are making uh, to make sure that uh, our supply sourcing is, is uh, resilient as we move forward. So these are some of the things which I wanted to talk about, but very happy to sort of engage with any one of you offline if you want to know about more about HUL or you want to know more about HUL procurement, very happy to engage uh, with you offline. And uh, back to you, Dr. Dipankar. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tuli. It was very interesting to know about HUL. Uh, 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 the, you know, the sustainable sourcing, you know, responsible sourcing, and definitely the three, four things that you just mentioned about climate, nature, plastic, and livelihood, and your company's target to be net zero by 2039. So uh, with this, I just uh, like to you know, put you know, the first question to you, is how can uh, remote sensing technologies be effectively utilized? Uh, sorry, sir, I just missed out. I'm so sorry. You almost stumped me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what impact does climate change have on supply chain risk and how can strategic procurement help mitigate this risk? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. Very, very pertinent question in these, uh, in these times. And uh, I think I just also will complement this with one more example which, uh, which I'll give to you. Uh, like it's very important to know about your supply sources and very important to be able to predict how much supply you're going to get, okay? Uh, so we have uh, implemented a technology in case of T, where we have uh, prediction tools which help analyze the weather conditions, the soil conditions, and then they are able to sort of help us predict the supply one month, two month, three month hence. And we monitor the accuracy of uh, uh, these supply predictions on a regular basis. And this is the way I think we are using technology and also we are experimenting with a lot of use of uh, artificial intelligence which we plan to roll out to our other crops like uh, dairy and tomatoes uh, and coffee to make sure that equally in those crops as well, as well, we are able to predict the supply. So I think it's important for uh, procurement teams to know that uh, where their, uh, uh, the crops are coming from, what are the risks to those crops, uh, have very clear sort of uh, supply prediction mechanisms. As I talked about, diversification of suppliers is very, very critical not just the geography of the uh, diversification, but also the suppliers. So, so for each of our crops and materials, for example, we work at alternative suppliers. So we can't work with only one or two suppliers. We have uh, two or three options which are available for each of our uh, crops and materials which we source. So I think those are some of the things which we are uh, really working on. And then we uh, want to use uh, technology in a big way. So we basically have uh, a digital uh, function here and uh, my team really works uh, uh, really hard on getting all these digital initiatives in place uh, so that we are able to uh, make sure that we predict supply, we predict prices, we are able to sort of see proactively uh, where the uh, issue is going to go wrong and uh, help sort of uh, navigate the supplies. One more thing which we have done is that we are partnering with a company called Risk Methods and uh, before any of these events are striking us, they are able to sort of proactively help in terms of identifying the hotspots where this is likely to occur. And uh, that helps us in developing mitigating strategies. So this is what we called resilience management. And now we are sort of progressing uh, big time in terms of leveraging the technology to drive resilience. And uh, here we are able to predict some of these events and we are able to work with this company risk methods, which is able to tell us that these are the hotspots happening and please do diversify your uh, sourcing base accordingly. So some initiatives we are taking and I think uh, much more to come. And But it's very, very important for all the procurement teams to make sure that uh, they are on top of this uh, because this is going to happen. What I'm describing about the tea crop shortfall, the tomatoes issue, this is going to happen more and more. And I think all of us need to make sure that we are well prepared for that.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Tully. Thank you. Uh, while I'll put you a second question also, but I have a point here which I'll ask you in the second round. That is about you know the small tree growers, especially from Assam. Uh, they use extensive you know pesticide. So how do the companies have their strategy to you know control this and what kind of testing and all parameters are being adopted uh, to meet the FSSI guidelines. I will ask you in the second round. Sure. Yeah, so I'm just telling you about you know what uh, question that came up to me. Sure. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, now I would uh, introduce Dr. Mohammad Hamze. He's the product owner of the Blue Water Intelligence. And I request uh, Dr. Hamiz Hamze to speak on integrating earth observation data and machine learning for climate resilient water resource management in food and agriculture. Thank you. Over to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So I just, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I just need a few seconds to thank the organizers, uh, the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, uh, Invest India to organize this, uh, my colleagues, our, my neighbors for today, for the uh, last one hour now, uh, and uh, for introducing me. Uh, so I'm glad to be, uh, to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, and I want really to compliment, I'm lucky that I had, uh, I had to hear, to hear my, uh, the interventions before me. I want just to compliment what we just said. They, they, it, it covered everything that really I want to, to point out on. Uh, so we spoke about data that we need uh, to, in order to achieve the resilience that we want. And we spoke about uh, the technologies that we see every day. Every day we see a satellite sent to space. Everything we see a new technology going to light. But what matters for me is how to use this technology, how to use uh, the right uh, like solution to solve the right problem. So as uh, Dr. Alok said, all, a lot of technologies are site specific, are uh, like uh, related, uh, are needed, uh, is, it's needed to like train the model on the site in order to make it operational. And this needs a, an extensive database, and uh, which is very costly, usually operation and operational wise, and also uh, labor uh, labor wise. Uh, so, uh, what matters for us is also to think about our communities, our the, the farmers, our food systems. How can they handle the pressure of the changing climate every day and the unpredictable like uh, rainfall? The, 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 the risk that, uh, that is making uh, the communities hard to uh, live with their, uh, with their, with their, with their, with their like, uh, to face mitigate challenges that face, they face every day. So the, gay, the goal is simple. It's not like some people think, like, we have to stop using water. No, we have to s s start using water in a smart way. Smart way, I mean, uh, reduce, uh, increase the efficiency of the water use in order to, in, in a way, to not impact the 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 the, the crop yield. You know, uh, the crop yield, which is what we are speaking about today. Uh, and 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 I just want like to start now uh, to to speak about what I do. Uh, I'm an earth and water sciences specialist at Blue Water Intelligence, BWI France. Uh, we focus on uh, using cutting-edge technologies, uh, ranging from earth observation to machine learning to hydrological, hydrological modeling, in order to assess the water dynamics, uh, and we are specialized in surface water, and uh, to predict the water availability over the season, over years. So, uh, so our aim is to help better manage water resources and make sure we are prepared to any risk uh, like floods or water scarcity and uh, drought events that we, we see every, uh, every now and then now. They are more frequent uh, this period. Uh, one of uh, our major, uh, major projects is Data for Water, which is funded by the European Space Agency. Uh, this project focuses on the Godavari River Basin for now, and we are working, we are doing our best to make it scalable on other major basins on, in India. Uh, what we do provide is uh, real-time insights for farmers, fisheries, and food sectors, and other major sectors like hydropower that needs to know more about water availability and the flow of water in order to optimize their, their production. So they can make, with the data that we can provide, uh, smarter decisions about irrigation and water use uh, in order to optimize their practices. For example, uh, literature and assesses, the assessments that we made uh, on the Godavari on uh, several use cases have shown that we are able to uh, like, um, uh, reduce the water use to up to 20% without impacting the crop yields uh, if we are working with farmers. 
uh, and we have assessed that on, on a lot of crops, and, uh, and we, we have like, validated this, uh, this, uh, this uh, use case uh, on, the, on Telangana and in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, on irrigation sites. Uh, now I will speak uh, in general things in order to like, set the basics of our discussion, uh, my discussion today at least. Uh, water is becoming more and more scarce, climate change, unpredictable rainfall, and the growing demand for agriculture are putting immense pressure on water resources everywhere. In fact, around 70% of uh, fresh water resources uh, in the world uh, are, are used by irrigation and agriculture. So thinking in a way to better manage these resources is uh, crucial uh, for now. Uh, that's where uh, new technologies like Earth observation and machine learning really make a difference. But again, we have to think about how site-specific and how uh, crop-specific, if we were speaking about uh, agricultural use case, those models and those technologies can be. So extensive databases are, are needed, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of work is needed to, in order to make those uh, technologies uh, operational. And that's what we, we, we try to do uh, in, uh, in B at BWI uh, with the, the experts in hydrology and agriculture, as me, uh, we do. So what's exciting for me, and I've been working six years on this ri uh, right now, is this, that these tools can give the data that we need in order to, more, uh, to make more informed decision, and I like to call it, as my colleagues said, data-informed decisions about water use. So we can ensure by that uh, that we are well prepared not only to optimize our practices, but also to risks like floods and droughts that are more frequent right now. Uh, so, in my opinion, it's crucial to start thinking this way in order to uh, start building a more resilient, sustainable uh, food uh, system. So, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, uh, interesting to know about the use of AI and MI for you know water efficiency, uh, and which is definitely data driven. Uh, I would like to ask you. Uh, how can uh, remote sensing technologies be effectively utilized to monitor surface water levels in agricultural water? And what strategies can be implemented to prevent over-extraction and ensure sustainable water management, which we have already spoken about 20% less uses of water uh, in Telangana. So can you yes. take this up, question? Up thank 20%. you. Up to 20%, yes. yes. It depends on the crop. So thank you, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so when we are speaking about managing water in agriculture, we have to think about the challenge that you are facing. The main challenge, that we have three main challenges. We have to know how much water is available, how much water is needed by the crop to optimally produ produce, and how much water is being used. So surface water uh, is like very fluctuating. So if we need uh, really relevant information, uh, we need to use technology in order to know how much water is available, in order to start thinking even about how sustainable we can, uh, the, the, the food system that we can build. Uh, so many farmers, from my experience, especially in India, that I appreciate a lot, uh, like uh, rely on groundwater and uh, the nearby rivers in order to uh, pump water for irrigation. And uh, that's, that's really difficult in, all, uh, in a way, if we want to think, to think how we can uh, monitor the water use uh, uh, without like, data that is extensively uh, collected on vast areas, which is, like I said before, it's very costly. So here comes remote sensing and satellite data that can be like give you a, like a bird's, eye, uh, bird's eye vision uh, for vast areas, over vast areas, and would help this way to, uh, to monitor water bodies like re uh, reservoirs, lakes, and rivers. So with this, with this information, we can, we can uh, this information will allow us to monitor the water availability over a season, over years, and this information that will lead to make informed decision if we know how much water we have, how much water the crop would need using mod uh, modeling approaches that are also need like extensive databases that w we can provide and everyone ca can provide if we did like a, the, the data collection on a vast, way, uh, vast areas using remote sensing. And, uh, and doing this, by doing this, we can uh, try, uh, start to take decisions that has an impact on our food systems. 
Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question while you, you know, go to your seat yeah, is that yeah. can also uh, satellite uh, uh, data be utilized for underground water? Yes, yes or no? <laughs> can proceed yes, to your I seat. think Dr. <laughs> Dr. Alok maybe can, can help in this question. <laughs> but but my, my, my specialty was. Nee, nee, oh, I'm just I, asking is it yeah, possible or not? Yeah, I, I've, I, I've, only, I've only worked on uh, in, in surface European, water. Uh, surface water. Yeah. In so, Euro European countries. So, I will, I will ask the panelists no, after I can, this. I can, I can, he can, I can uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar would like to answer this, but I will, you can. Uh, but I can, I can answer shortly to this. Yeah. It's a combined approach usually between Earth observation and, uh, and, uh, and modeling. And we, if we have an information of a surface water using Earth observation, we can model using runoff data or, uh, or data about infiltration in the soil. We can model the groundwater availability in a certain accuracy. Thank you so much. Uh, we have amongst us uh, uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar, who is an agronomist uh, with FAO India, and he was earlier with CCS Haryana Agriculture University. Uh, may I request Mr. Kumar uh, to Dr. Kumar to speak on climate smart agriculture for food security and resilience? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dipankar, and thanks all who are attending here and my colleagues on the dais. So I am from Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations. And what the industry people are doing, so we provide the raw, raw material. We are working with the farmers. So FAO provides grant to industry, to the farmers, to the state government. So we provide grants only and monitor and also uh, educate the farmers and industry about the sustainable practices. So before I start, let us know about, because I have been researcher and teacher, so let us know about what is climate change for agriculture. So climate change is what? The long-term variability in weather parameters. If it is for a five years or 10 years, then we'll say that the climate change is happening. So what weather parameters are important for agriculture? So temperature and precipitation, these two, they are very important. So temperature will decide the, say, your time of sowing, then your fertilization, and the duration of the crop, how long it will stay on the ground. And precipitation will decide the growth of the crops. So why we are saying that the, we are affected by the climate change? Because our main food system is rice and wheat, so which is feeding our country, and even we are exporting now. So rice and wheat system, we have one project currently going on. So what we are doing, we are promoting the sustainable food systems to replace rice and wheat in many states. So currently we have four states, two states, Punjab and Haryana. They are very important because they have degraded their land, they have depleted their water, and they are emitting more greenhouse gases. So these two states. Then we are taking the two states, Odisha and Chhattisgarh, which they are going towards the same end where Punjab and Haryana went. So they are uh, expanding their area under rice and wheat, and they are also using more groundwater. So in rice crop, these states, they use groundwater. They don't use canal water. So groundwater resources, they are depleting, and the water tables, they are depleting at a rate of 50 to 1 meter, 50 centimeter to 1 meter per year. And in these states where the water was around say 10 feet or 12 feet at some time in 70s. Now it is 47 meters. So it is means uh, it is very uh, important to either to restore that water table or to stop that at this level. So what we are doing, what uh, all the industry people are saying that the farmers they are saying that we, we will not uh, uh, stop growing rice and wheat because they get more profit. 
but we are asking them that you change what the, the other speakers are saying, sustainable practices. So what are those sustainable practices like the planting method? So we are promoting the direct seeding of rice. So that uses 30 to 40 percent less water as compared to the traditional methods. And then we are promoting the uh, other crops in place of rice, say maize. So rice is emitting lot of methane, nitrous oxide, so which are causing the climate change. So we are diversifying towards the maize. So that is diversification, going from the uh, more water using crops, more fertilizer using crops to the millets, say. Millets, they, they are also drought tolerant. So the uh, agriculture is a state subject and whatever we are seeing in one state, that will not be applicable to other states. Even the government will not allow. Like if I, I am using one variety in Punjab, I cannot use that in Tamil Nadu because there are rules. You have to go by the policy. You have what varieties or hybrids recommended for Punjab, they will be recommended by the Punjab government. You have to grow those hybrids and varieties there. So we are working with the, the states to save water, to uh, improve soil health, to reduce greenhouse gases. And then we are linking with the, those farmers which are growing this sustainable produce. We are requesting the industry, and also we have meetings with the industry, that you buy that sustainable produce at higher price, at premium price, because that farmer or that producer is uh, saving our environment. So we are linking the industry also with those people. And we provide also grant to the industry that you associate with the farmers, we will provide the grant. So in this way, I think then if the production system is sustainable, then the whole value change will be sustained. So and then the farmers or uh, the, the value chain experts, they will be resilient to the food system. So that's what we are doing. And I think that's the way forward for a sustainable and resilient agriculture. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, for your uh, view on the climate smart agriculture that you have suggested for diversification and definitely to make our uh, agriculture more climate resilient. Uh, the question to you is that what impact does climate smart agriculture have on improving the resilience of food supply chain to climate related disruption? Yeah, like climate smart agriculture practices, which we are saying planting method, we change the planting method from more water using to less water using. Then we are going for organic natural farming so that the soil health will be improved. So we are also using biofertilizers to improve the uh, microbes in the soil because the microorganisms, they make available all the fertilizers to the crops. So we are doing that. So these, and even in the, the beginning, what some of the speaker was, were saying, that mixed cropping, our farmers, they were long back, they were using the mixed cropping. They would say in pearl millet, you, some might be knowing millets, in millets they were uh, mixing cholesterol bean. That, is, that was for their animals. And then they were mixing mung bean. That was a pulse crop. So first they, they were harvesting pearl millet, then cholesterol bean, and then mung bean. But now the science, they have made that you make it a row intercropping, means within the rows. So we are not mixing that. But ICR and state agriculture universities, they, they are doing research on that. And most of the practices which they recommend, and they are producing results. And some of the government schemes like Mera Pani, Meri Virasat in Haryana, if you diversify, you will get incentive. Farmers are getting 7,000 per acre. If you 
change from rice to maize, you will get 7,000 per acre. So there are many schemes, Pradhan Mantri Kirsi Vikas Yojana. So there are many schemes this government is pr promoting and the farmers they are switching over to. Uh, you might have read in the news that in Punjab, the area under DSR, direct seed rice, increased to 3 lakh hectares. So farmers, they are adopting, but they are looking at the industry because the government cannot support for a long time. So industry has to come in to supply inputs and take their output. And that model, FAO is promoting uh, all over India and under different schemes, not only in crops, in animals, uh, animals and poultry. So all over we are supporting those projects. So I also take this opportunity to invite our friends if they have uh, time. So we can, we, we can collaborate on those issues. So yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, definitely agree on uh, the requirement. You can go and uh, can take your seat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the requirement of mixed cropping, intercropping, crop rotation, and permaculture. And definitely, the mix is there in the field. And also, we have a mixed panelist here of people from the industry and uh, from uh, FOA. So uh, now uh, we come to end of the first round of questions. Uh, I will just go through very quickly the second round of questions. I think we'll have about two minutes each. Then we'll have a Q&A session with the audience. So, uh, uh, I'll come back to Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, that what policy measures and investment are required to facilitate the widespread adoption of space tech in agriculture for resource optimization? Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so with your permission, can I answer that question? That is it possible or not? Yeah. Remote sensing, yes. Yeah. So I would like to share uh, with, uh, just, so whenever we are discussing about remote sensing and all, uh, means I have been into this, uh, I, uh, before this I was also a guest lecturer and teaching and all. So I used to discuss that uh, we need to understand that remote sensing should not be confined to only data acquisitions and all. Whenever we are, uh, we try to do any kind of analytics on remote sensing. This has to be segregated into two segments, that is absolute analysis and indicative analysis. That absolute analysis uh, is good for surface uh, water analysis. And groundwater, we have uh, there are so many researches and everything that models are developed for the groundwater analysis also. But it falls under the category of indicative analysis. Now, indicative analysis is the function of the, you no know, see, when we go for this one, so remote sensing should be uh, when we discuss about remote sensing, it is not about just the optical plane, that the microwave, microwave, thermal parameters and all. If the certain set of parameters, the parameters are like optimal, and then you have a, means a good technique which can exploit the potential, then it is possible. But it, it is under the category of indicative analysis. And then with all humility, I would like to say, whenever we discuss about modeling, it is indicative analysis. Like in farm when you go, so then, like crop cutting experiment, it's absolute data. But the moment we do any kind of analysis through modeling, it's indicative analysis. Now indicative analysis, the findings, if it gets very closer to the absolute analysis, then it's a, uh, absolute success. So we need to uh, take care of those things, and if the things are in place, then we will have we may have encouraging results. The policy, uh, yes, some now policy the second question. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. Now the second question. Yeah. Uh, Regarding policy, sir, with all humility, I would like to say and uh, a few things. Uh, the recent uh, few of the announcements by the government are actually, actually very encouraging because the dedicated fund pool and all are there for the private pa parties in the research and all. But I have some specific uh, pointers on this. If in terms of policy to encourage space tech analytics and space tech players into the spectrum, I have a very simple uh, kind of a, uh, from the research perspective side and the implementation side also. Let's make the entire data loss, uh, loss estimation ex exercise through data driven. Intimation is there, then people go there, then they do the, they do the analysis and all. Let's make the data driven analysis primary and then that one. So what will happen? 
will be bound to use space tech AI driven analysis. Now it, it will become an absolute necessity. The second thing is that in the very, uh, my uh, first question also, and I think the, uh, the introductory remark also I said, data driven insurance and all. What will again happen? There is no other way. We need to estimate the thresholds. We need to understand the complexity and all. Automatically space tech, data science, AI players, players will be in the, uh, uh, will, will become the central part of the scheme. Now, the second thing, uh, without pinpointing, if any policy by any state or government or may, uh, from the corporate side or any kind of funds, or uh, means uh, regarding some kind of projects, if it is about yield analysis, again, we know that we are also from the data center AI fraternity, but uh, I, I always believe that we cannot uh, ignore the, 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 the root things. Keep the absolute parameter, the CC, uh, integral component, but don't make it a, like a majority of the entire uh, framework. If it happens, it will uh, dilute the process. So these things actually should be inculcated because now some of the projects are floated where like CC is like more than 50-60% weightage. This will, this, this, can invite, this, will be, this can invite like kind of many red flags in the future. Dilution is like, it's an open invitation to dilution. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, now I come back to uh, Mr. Shantanu Sharma uh, with your second question. Uh, what is the role that artificial intelligence and deep technology play in climate resilience? And how can the latest technology be driver for achieving sustainability in food industry? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I think um, everything from space tech to um, monitoring of water levels to what you mentioned about uh, data-based insurance, all of it plays a role. But I'll hold on to the concept of artificial intelligence. Um, technology in itself, um, and I may be called out for this, technology in itself is useless unless you use it for something. Um, there are so many applications of AI, especially in food, um, and we are limiting ourselves to uh, just collecting data and then working on it manually. It makes zero sense for you to collect data from a remote place, bring it to your office and then look at it manually, when the same thing can be done automatically. The intelligence that we have to use is to find solutions to the things that we have found and not try to then redo the work that is already done by the machine. Um, and this applies from everything throughout the supply chain, right from the production to how this crop is brought to, let's say, a storage and what happens with it at storage and then how is it going to the industry and then to the consumer. Everything can be tracked by AI, everything can be um, looked at in a certain way. In fact, here only at one of the stalls, we have a solar powered uh, uh, truck that can carry crop from your farmer to a warehouse. So solutions are there. It is just that we have to understand that AI has to be used as any other technology and using it in terms of how can I improve three or four things. One is how can I make it useful for the farmer? Because no matter how many times I'm able to give relief or how many times I give a grant or how many times I'm able to do something, till the farmer sees return on actual economical point of view, he will not adopt something. So can we give information based on their own growth in AI formats to the value chain of whoever is handling the logistics, to whoever is handling at the warehouse, AI forms a role at all of these places. And that's where I think AI and deep tech can be used today, where we are using deep tech and AI for things which are uh, for our own luxury improvement, this is basic. So we should be using it here instead of uh, trying to improve our own luxuries. Okay. So thank you. Uh, definitely yes, but uh, how soon we can reach to majority of the farmers, that is the challenge uh, that we have uh, in our country. Uh, next, very quickly I come to uh, Ms. Bhatia. Uh, your second question, uh, what role does government policy play in promoting climate smart agriculture practices to secure farmers' livelihoods? So I think I uh, covered a lot of it in my in initial, initial remarks, C, uh, yes. speech as well. But you know, I just want to give an example. 
I think uh, the recently the uh, in the horticultural sector, uh, the national mission on edible oils and palm oils was um, implemented by the announced, and in that the government has encouraged intercropping, so especially also all other crops including cocoa. So for us, uh, you know, that's a big unlock in terms of actually leveraging palm oil farms for intercropping of cocoa. So the government certainly plays a very important role. This is just one example. As I had mentioned earlier, of course, subsidies, incentives to the farmers, et cetera. All of that goes really a long way in all of this, so. Yes, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, my next question is to Mr. Tully, which I already asked. You can just briefly mention that if you have, and I can ask you one more question that I, I have here. But you can ask the initial that I, uh, asked you regarding yep. uh, the pesticide yep. contents of uh, the tea leaves or any other product that you source, uh, how do you uh, have a check on that? Yeah. No, thanks, very pertinent uh, question. So I think what uh, basically we are doing is uh, a few things. One is that uh, we do a lot of uh, training programs for our uh, smallholder farmers, okay, because uh, you will know that uh, tea is 50% uh, uh, sourced from the large estates, which of course have uh, a lot of good uh, agricultural uh, uh, practices. Uh, but in the small holders, we need to do a lot of hand-holding, a lot of training, and we uh, basically use uh, the work which we do with Trusty. Trusty, we are co-founders of that, uh, done almost uh, 10 years back. And we use that setup to uh, organize a number of training programs for the farmers in terms of the optimum use of the pesticide. So that's one thing which we are doing. The second thing is that we are again, I think, working uh, on the technology front. Uh, we are trying to distribute kits because uh, ultimately it's all coming uh, from the farms. Uh, so if we can have some rapid detection kits, which in a matter of uh, five minutes uh, can tell you what is the level of pesticides in the green leaves, I think that uh, can be a real game changer. So we are experimenting with that technology. We are working with a vendor. And that's something which we intend to uh, roll out to. But I think uh, what we are doing is uh, a lot of uh, education, a lot of uh, training, a lot of awareness programs. And especially we are uh, really committed to make sure that our small holders are able to use the uh, pesticides in the most uh, optimum way which is there. Yeah, thank you Mr. Tully. Definitely agree that a lot of awareness and trainings are required. Uh, the farmers there, the small tree growers are not aware of the harmful effects of pesticide. And I've heard that government of Assam is deep into it to curb the utilization and also, you know, uh, giving lots of impetus to testing and setting up uh, food testing labs uh, to check the pesticide level. Uh, now, my uh, quick question would be to Dr. Mohammed, uh, that how can combination of earth observation and machine learning contribute to the development of sustainable agriculture practices that minimize water use. You have already done quite a lot of projects that you can just quickly, you know. Thank you, Dr. Uh, just yeah. come back for a few seconds for what yes. was said by Dr. Alok and Mr. Sharma. Uh, AI, we have to see it in a way, it's a, it's a machine taught by, by human beings. It's not something coming from a uh, force that we don't know. So I see it sometimes as few uh, lines of code even. So what we have to rely on is not artificial intelligence, it became a word that to sell. Uh, what we have to rely on on the, on the application, where we are applying, if the user, end user is really getting the most out of it in his application, if he's paying for something, we'll get his get, he'll get, he's getting the return on investment because um, as we, I can see, I'm from France and in Europe, it's the startup revolution now and I can imagine here in India the same. So we are selling, we are using always this term in order to sell. And uh, some people are really uh, like, uh, yeah, be, be, being trapped in this uh, circle. So we have to think more about, and what we usually miss is in the accuracy indicator, because Dr. Alok spoke about the um, indication. So, so we have to assign to every AI method or every result coming from AI an accuracy uh, indicator unless, uh, because transparency is everything, and AI at the end, what he does is, I want to summarize in a few words, he finds relationships that a human being cannot sometimes uh, find it uh, uh, like bare eyes. 
So that's what, what I can summarize AI with. Uh, and coming back to the real question, so my, the question uh, uh, using, like, if we want to speak about, uh, about water availability, over extraction, as I said before, uh, we need historical trends. And when we speak about historical trends uh, combined with real-time real data from space, we are speaking about big, big databases. And if we want to uh, assess and uh, study over extraction, over an area, we need, uh, we need to study those databases, so we need AI. This is the main application of AI in, in our case, uh, speaking in our, our, our use case. And when we provide data over countries like India, France, Senegal, we have projects everywhere. So, so we, need, uh, we need to, in order to train our models and assess the database that we're working on, we need something powerful like AI. Uh, I just want to give an example about uh, what, we, uh, what we did on the Godavari, for example. Uh, we developed protective models for water availability, uh, and we integrate the subrivation to the hydrological modeling, and uh, in order to give farmers and water management managers like uh, up to 10 days of water availability forecast in order to anticipate their strategies, if we are speaking about agriculture and irrigation. So if, we, if, they, if they can know, that in, in two days you have a low water level or a drought event, like uh, so stop using water for the last two days, or start thinking for the last year if you'll change the crop or choose a water, resili a water stress resilient crop that can adapt to your uh, new climate uh, impacted uh, uh, environment. So that's what I want to Thank add. Thank you. Sorry for the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my final question, a very quick answer I would require. How can education extension services empower farmers? Yeah. I think as... I think audible, I am. Yeah, yeah. So as, yeah, Tulisa has said, so what is uh, the, means the, there are many applications. Even the apps, they teach the uh, farmers. But training and hand holding of small holders, that is very important. So if you train them, hand hold them, then they can uh, go for the new technology. Otherwise, they will not go. So this is happening. We, we are uh, training people. We, then we have to train the master trainers, which are available all the time with the farmers. So that is very important. If you have master trainers there, so either they can be government employees, they can be progressive farmers. So with some incentive, you find out the master trainers and then they can handhold with the small stakeholders. So education and training for farmers to adopt sustainable practices or climate sustainable agriculture is very important. So it is very important. So thank yeah. you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, to all my panelists, uh, I'd like to have a quick Q&A session. Uh, so uh, maybe not, we are already, uh, but we'll definitely have this. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the wonderful keynotes. I am Vignesh. I'm representing Climate Group. So my question is to Opera, ma'am. So as we all know that uh, this uh, food waste is a very pressing uh, issue in a food value chain, especially contributing about eight to 10 percent for the global gas emission. So my question is like, how Mondelez addresses the food waste, especially in cocoa production, and uh, supports the climate resilience? Thank you. So, you know, we have the expert in the room. So I'm going to ask Rajesh, the expert in the room, to address this. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. Uh, in fact, uh, Mondelez, as part of our Cocoa Life program, uh, has developed a good agriculture practices with a good environmental practices. So few things what we focus is on understanding the weather pattern, developing certain what we call as dues, early, uh, 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 early warning systems, and take some uh, prophylactic steps. That is one part. Second thing, wastage can be reduced by timing of the operations also. 
This is something which we have worked with the Kerala Agriculture University and developed as part of our good agriculture practices. And we have reduced the wastage to a very large extent. I'll tell you with an example. In West Africa, the productivity of a cocoa tree is about 750 grams of beans per tree. In the Indian context, we are able to produce up to 2 kilos per tree. The reason is uh, the scientific application of certain uh, fungicides and the timely application correlated with the weather pattern of weather predictions we are able to utilize. So we are able to uh, correlate some of the data uh, available and communicating to the farm is also important. So farmers are not interested in wasting of any of their materials. So if we are able to communicate and convince the farmer they will be taking the steps at the farm level and reduce the wastage to a very large extent. So this is one, one example which we can see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Barsha and I'm representing SM Seagal Foundation. My question is for Mandeep, sir. As a... Uh, the concern has been al uh, already raised by the Pankar, sir, regarding the pesticides used uh, for tea plantation. As we all know, in Assam is a monopoly for tea plantation and muga rearing culture. So in the upper, uh, upper part of Assam, um, you know, like uh, tea, tea plantation and muga production are uh, doing in outdoor, uh, outdoor area. So while using the pesticides, you know, like um, the Muga larva uh, get affected. So when you use the pesticide, like, uh, are you taking any measures for taking care of the Muga larva, uh, considering the uh, pests, uh, I mean, considering the pest management for the tea leaves? Yeah. Look, I'll follow my colleague because I think your question is very uh, technical. So I will request my colleague Daliram, who is heading the sustainability, to answer Thank that you. question, if you don't mind. Thank you for the question. Now, tea is a unique crop with a plant protection code by Tea Board of India, which has a list of agrochemicals which can be sprayed in tea. So there is a label claim, and the data is submitted by Tea Research Association. So that is taken care of. Now, this is the regulation. The second part is the FSSA MRL, which Dr. Saria also pointed out. So two organization, Tea Board, TRA, FSSA. In fact, three organizations are actually the guiding force behind the use of agrochemicals in tea. And then our job is, through our sustainable sourcing journey, we ensure that the program follows the plant protection code of Tea Board of India. At the same time, also adhere to the FSSA MRLs, which is law of the land. Third most important is, when more than 50% of the production coming from smallholder farmer, that is a challenge. Now, that is where most of our efforts are directed to ensure that all these smallholder farmers adhere to the plant protection code, adhere to the FSSA MRLs, and this is a long journey. Quite challenging, but then we are on it. It's going to take time, but yes. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's give uh, the other person one. Thank you. My name is Priyam Vada. I'm from Mumbai, looking for uh, joining a technological program, especially in uh, sustainability and resiliency via data-driven technologies. Uh, we spoke about 130 zone points, and uh, achieving the required threshold for each zone would be naturally different. So are we planning to proceed uh, once we will reach the requirements of this 130 zone? Are we go, uh, planning to go further deep dive and uh, approaching all the farmers or these 130 zones are finalized? And I would like to extend this question that since we are having uh, the sustainability uh, chain developed already for uh, having the required transparency, I would also wish to know what are last leg challenges we are finding. And uh, I'm pretty sure there would be because I have worked through them and uh, we are not having a concrete solution yet in even healthcare. So how are we going to use the current technology to mitigate those challenges? Do we have any such programs going on? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, ma for your question. Uh, yes, around 100, means 127 ecological zones. So what I was trying to say th that time, uh, first of all, firstly, first and foremost, 
considering 127 ecological zones to develop thresholds is itself a huge thing. Many companies, and with all responsibility and humility and all conviction I wish to share that uh, most of the yield models, most of the analysis on productive dynamics right now are not considering thresholds for the ecological zones, different ecological zones. So paddy from ecological zone, suppose A, is not considering the threshold for ecological zone B. So in our company, uh, one year back only, we started uh, to uh, perform a study on different ecological zones for the same crop and then changing the crop from crop A to crop B to understand that what are the dynamics. Now suppose. A uh, paddy is there. So what could be that unified equation for Haryana and then in Uttar Pradesh? So what could be that? What are the coefficients that are varying? Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Ashutosh Thakar and I'm a merchant exporter. Uh, uh, as uh, Mandip, sir, uh, discussed about procurement strategy uh, and uh, also mentioned about reliable supplies. Sir, my question is... Uh, Uh, whenever I'm procuring uh, coconut uh, from farmers, they only say, ye itna bada hai, ye chota hai, this is big. So there is no grading system at all, as farmers say. So uh, can you guide us? Uh, is there yeah. any grading system? So, see, cocoa I can't answer because we don't buy a lot of cocoa, but I think generally I'll just give a, try to give a general answer to your, uh, to your question. So basically what we do is I think the first step is to define the specifications very clearly for the materials which you are buying. Okay. So when we are working with the suppliers, we make sure that for each of the parameters, whether it is the size, whether it is any the, of the moisture content, we define the specifications and try to agree between us and the supplier very clearly on what should be the specification. So there is a sheet which is prepared and we discuss that sheet uh, with our suppliers and both uh, Unilever and the supplier, they sign on to that sheet. Okay, and that's the basis of the document. So when the incoming arrival comes or when we do the testing at the supplier's end, we follow that sheet and on each of the parameters, it also defines the testing methods that how are you supposed to test for those specifications. So it's very clearly put in black and white on that sheet and that's the basis on which the supplier is sending the material and that's the basis on which we are accepting the material. Lot of cases, you're right, I think it can happen in terms of the disconnect what you're talking about. In that case, I think we need to work closely with the supplier, tell him how to produce to the specifications of Unilever and that's basically the way we uh, proceed further on this. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I think we had a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Very important points came out. Some of those are like the data driven driven insurance uh, that uh, Dr. Mukherjee mentioned earlier. Uh, then about the data-driven plan, which Shantanu mentioned about that why data is so important for each step from for the whole uh, uh, f uh, food supply uh, chain. Uh, then we came to know from Ms. Bhatia about uh, the that you know first time 1995. 1955 that cocoa was introduced in India and all the things uh, very important you know one lakh farmers three million uh, three million yeah so <laughs> sustainable food production improving eff efficiency you know low carbon so all these are very important point and collaboration partnership uh, then uh, again from Mr. Tully about uh, HEUL uh, a target of 2039 to be net zero then their uh, uh, that contribution to climate, nature, less use of plastic and livelihood and definitely tea was of great interest for all of us and sustainable and uh, you know responsible sourcing that has been one of the very important part that uh, uh, came up in the discussion and definitely the huge uh, post harvest loss that is happening all over India. And uh, we also came about uh, from uh, Dr. Mohammed about you know the water efficiency, how we can really use less water and still not lose the productivity of the production. So important for all of us when there is dire. And how uh, Mr. Uh, Kumar, uh, Dr. Kumar also mentioned about that how groundwater has depleted uh, from 12 feet to 47 uh, meters. That is huge and that is a matter to worry of. So 
we know that climate is changing. We are all feeling the effect, especially the small uh, holders, the small farmers. And now the way out is that, you know, we really need to plan out our future. We really need to think about innovation. Whatever they are doing, they are still sustaining. So let's work together along, along with the modern things that are happening. We really have to work in the field and also ensure that all the AI, MI, and the data are really reaching to the, to the place where it is really required. So everything is important, but at the same time, we should also you know, bring our indigenous knowledge and see that we don't lose it. Younger generation are moving out from their places and moving to urban areas. So documentation is also very important and probably a big, you know, you have the data people, you know, sitting here and definitely I think, you know, there will be come up when, you know, data from the indigenous communities will also be required. With this, I end this session. Uh, I would like to thank all my uh, co-panelists. It has been wonderful to hear from you, uh, from all of you, different fields, different perspective, water, cocoa, deep uh, uh, ice cream and the data and uh, FAO uh, and uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, from uh, uh, the field of water. And thank you all the audience for your patience, you know, in getting through this whole uh, panel. And thank you all. Thank you all once again. And thank you to the Ministry of, uh, you know, the Food Processing uh, Government of India for organizing this. Thank you for the organizer. Thank you so much. So we have a gift uh, to be given to the uh, panelists. Uh